Without further ado, I'd like to welcome Michael DeRoche. Thank All you. Right. All right, so uh, yeah, so I'm from Polite Mail, and we have some tools we add into Outlook to help you uh, measure your communications, uh, have some brand control with the responsive design and some list management. So we address some communications issues that are, are common inside of Outlook um, and just add some functionality to it. And what we're going to talk about uh, today is some of the Office 365 tools. So primarily email. We'll also cover you know a little bit of SharePoint because you know email and intranets are primary communication vehicles. Uh, but there's also some uh, new tools in Office 365 that we'll cover, primarily the video uh, stuff, which you may or may not know exists in there, and then also some Power BI stuff. Uh, and there's really a lot of innovation going on. I know most of you are communications, not technical. So uh, us being on the technical side, we see a lot of new features and functionality uh, that applies to communications coming into Office 365 almost daily at this point. Um, so it's something to keep track of and something to keep your IT team aware of because there's a lot of solutions that you already have that they might not even know exist uh, in there. Um, so what I'm going to do today is uh, talk about um, kind of all our customer data or a large percentage of our uh, customer data uh, and how that can provide some insights into your own uh, email program. So we've got some anonymous aggregated data and some analysis in Power BI that, that I'll uh, show you and try to give you some insights that can help your communications programs. Uh, and so this is what uh, our data is based on. So different industries, different volumes uh, sent kind of all over the world to, to employees. And then uh, Eric uh, Jaffe uh, runs the communications for Microsoft, and you can probably be more specific about exactly what programs we've been working with Microsoft uh, for a long time. And he's going to go over some case studies and research on their communications that they've done to help uh, you know, with, uh, you can probably take some of those insights away for your own use as well. Eric. Hi, I'm Eric Jaffe. Um, I uh, came to Microsoft in 2010, and um, we know that uh, email is sort of our employees' most preferred vehicle to receive information. So I think we've, we've long wanted something different, but email still is the most preferred vehicle. And um, uh, we probably, back in 2010, sent email like you guys do today through Outlook. Um, but we'd spend hours as a team sort of debating uh, what should the image be, what should the subject line be, what should the headline be. Um, we'd, we'd feel really good about our decisions. We'd send it out, and we'd have no idea if we made the right decisions. And so um, in 2012, we uh, partnered with Michael and brought Plight Mail on board. Um, 2013, I got involved uh, in it. And since 2013, we've sent uh, over 31 million emails. Um, and each of those represent an opportunity to understand how you know, different levers can impact engagement. And so uh, we'll get into that a little bit today, and I think there's some really interesting, uh, interesting numbers. We um, at Microsoft have, um, since uh, 2012, we've got 90 groups now using uh, Polite Mail with over 300 users. So there's a big base uh, here. Uh, and we've supported the effort with a cross-functional team from Azure, IT, employee comms, and exchange. So really all of us working together to make sure that the integration with Polite Mail is working seamlessly for, for everyone. All right. So the uh, kind of the why people use Polite Mail, I touched on this before, but um, we didn't even know this problem existed when we, when we first started. We, you know, we primarily started as just having the, the measurement and the, the kind of the genesis of Polite Mail is uh, we used to call read receipts rude receipts because you, know, you want to know if someone opened your email, but you don't want to get interrupted and asked, you know, so-and-so wants to know, you know ignore. Um, so we tried to do a transparent method of, of tracking those opens, so the polite version of read receipts uh, was the genesis. Uh, and then we quickly found out, particularly in larger companies, that, that the lists that are available in Exchange or Active Directory uh, aren't necessarily everything you need and also aren't necessarily accurate. So we added some uh, segmentation and list management tools that integrate with your HR system. Uh, it has a manual option, so you can import lists, and then there's an automated option where it can synchronize nightly with those HR databases and just keep those distribution groups uh, up to date. And then the other thing it allows you to do is do some ad hoc 
uh, list creation and segmentation on your own without putting in an IT ticket or asking HR to pull data for you. Uh, those key attributes like management level or you know region location are there, and you can just create a list on the fly and send it. Hey, Mike, uh, maybe I'll, this this is a huge function for for us in that. Um, you know, if we want to um, do something where an alias doesn't exist, so for example, we want to target um, employees who are participating in our US 401k program who aren't contributing uh, at a level to get the match, we can work with HR, we can pull a list, and we can upload that and send, you know, within uh, a matter of minutes. So the ability to really sort of micro-target really easily through the, through the list management is, uh, is a huge function for us. Yeah, I know when we first started with uh, uh, Sarah, she was trying to solve for that because what the old process was, you'd have to get the list put into Exchange, which would take like a week, a week or two weeks. And oftentimes, by the time that got done, your your opportunity for the date. message was was passed. So, question. Um, let me. I'm sorry. Let me interrupt really quickly and just give you a microphone since we're doing some audio recording. Thank you. So my company recently transitioned to using Office 365 mail, and one of the limitations with that for us has been that you can only send to 500 people in an email. So does Polite Mail, if you upload the list like you are saying, bypass the need to create that distro list? It does, yes. So you can upload you know, 10,000 names into, into Polite Mail and send it, and it bypasses the limitations. So it treats it as the one recipient, basically? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it doesn't, but the way we integrate with Exchange, it kind of bypasses those inherent Office 365 limits. So we're, we're talking to Exchange directly as opposed to going through the outbox. So the, the 5,000 per message and the 10,000 per day limits go away. All right. And then the next, the next key thing is the, the measurement. Um, and what Playmail does is we measure the, all the key metrics, uh, the opens and the clicks, but also the, the read time, uh, which I'll get into a little bit later. So you can actually tell if people are reading the content uh, that you're sending. And then uh, the last piece is the, the brand elements and the responsive design, so the ability to create some brand standards and share those with the team and have everyone working off of the same uh, page. Uh, and so what we do is, you know, again, it's an Outlook add-in, so we're not asking you to learn a completely new system. It's still your same email process. We're just putting some new tools uh, into Outlook. Uh, and then sending mail is just like Outlook. You just tell it when you want to measure a particular broadcast or not. So you click the polite mail flag, you're measuring. You don't click it. It's just your regular day-to-day -day email. So what we do is we turn, you know, we'll get, we're going to turn that on you know, all employees list, that one message, into uh, you know, a series of messages that we hand off to Exchange. And each of those will be tracked uh, independently. Um, so the measurement in that case will be accurate down to an individual. So with some tools, you're measuring uh, you know, opens where if one person opens on multiple devices, which is pretty common, each of those is going to count separately. Uh, whereas play mail, we're going to track it as a person opened on multiple devices. So your your open rates and your read time and stuff will all be accurate down to your audience size. And then there's different tracking modes, um, and this is important, particularly if uh, you have employees in the EU, um, or in, you know, in some companies' cases, they just you know, there's just privacy restrictions in general. So um, there's the aggregate level tracking, which tracks the message and not the recipient. So that's there's no PII data involved. <clears throat> but it also reduces that accuracy, right? So every different device someone uses gets counted separately. Uh, anonymous tracking, which is primarily what Microsoft uses, um, is you know, accurate down to the individual. But we disassociate individuals from their interactions. So we know who the email was sent to, but we don't know what they did with it. So for uh, people in the EU where you know, personal privacy is important, they're not, they're not directly related. You can't figure out exactly who did what, um, but you are, the metrics are accurate down to that level. And then we do have the, the individual tracking. So for certain uh, companies and also certain uh, HR functions, you know, if you're doing particular benefits emails and you want to follow up on the people that did or didn't click a specific link with individual tracking, you can get that level of segmentation and then do appropriate follow-up. So if you have employees in the, in the US, then a lot of companies, that's, that's what they use. And then the metrics reporting is available right inside of Outlook. So this is uh, kind of what we're giving you for a particular message or a group of messages as a, as a campaign or by list or by sender. Uh, so you can get you know your opens, reads, clicks, and there's a bunch of uh, charts and graphs, uh, and then um, you know down to 
um, you know, type of devices and time of day and region and all these are all the various uh, links that were included and you can you know down to a specific story what people uh, took action on and then what I'm going to be um, showing you mostly is our Power BI version so we're taking that same uh, polite mail data and putting it into more of a, an executive dashboard uh, and so this gives you higher level metrics and this data that we're looking at here is across uh, all the customer bases so in the lower corner you can see the the various industry segments, uh, technology and healthcare be being our biggest, financials, consumer, uh, real estate, and there's a bunch of other smaller groups in there. But those are the types of, of companies. And then these are the, the average metrics. So across the board, you know, open rates, 70.6%. Um, read rate. Uh, so a read rate is, you know, the recipients spent at least 30% of the message time that the message length was. So if you sent a one-minute uh, email, they, they watch, you know, were viewing that email for at least 30% of that one minute. Um, so that's a minimum threshold for readership. Uh, and then we also have uh, the engagement uh, rate, which tells you, you know, on average, how many, peop how much, how many people you know, spent uh, reading the email overall, as well as uh, we include clicks uh, in that. And then, of course, there's the, the click rate. So I'll get into more of some of that breakdown. Yeah, all internal. Yeah, we don't really do external. We have a few groups that do uh, sales support or partner support, that, or even like we have uh, Yum Brands who does a lot of their management email. All those managers actually use like Yahoo, Gmail type accounts, so that's kind of considered external, but um, the vast majority is all intercompany. I mean, that's still intercompany. But. I have another question here. Does it also count as open if they have kind of the reading pane? Are you guys able to track yep. if they have a Yeah, so the preview pane, I mean, I never double click a message. I, you know, I have a big enough screen so I can use the preview pane. So that preview pane counts as an open, and we can track the read time in there. So for as long as that's open. And we do have a category called left open. So, you know, if you have that message open, you open up Word and start doing something, or you go get a cup of coffee, we, we're still tracking that. But then when we hit that maximum threshold, we say, okay, it's, it's left open. We're going to. We're going to count them as re reading, but we're not going to keep track of the time after that point. All right. And then I'm going to turn it over to Eric, and he can talk to you a little bit about how specifically Microsoft uses it. Yeah. So, you know, we really use it for um, all of our major communications and all of our broad employee send. So everything from, you know, company uh, news and events. So our big, uh, you know, events that we have where we want to drive attendance, we'll use Polite Mail. We'll understand uh, what attendance looks like, what the engagement is. We'll make adjustments based on the data to, uh, as we follow up as we get closer to the event. We use it for all of our key executive sends. So uh, Satya, our, Satya Nadella, our CEO, holds a monthly Q&A. We use it to promote the event. We use it post-event to send out a recap, uh, and we look at the data uh, for that. And then we use it uh, a lot for our HR and benefits communications, so targeted 401k communications, open enrollment, promoting mammograms on campus, and, and other such programs. But with sending a lot of email and, and with 90 groups sending email, um, it can end up looking uh, a little bit confusing. Here's some IT communications. Here's some real estate communications. Here's some benefits communications um, and uh, some other communications. And so uh, in working with the brand team, we noticed a lot of inconsistency in how the brand was being applied in email. Um, and uh, while this actually doesn't look too far off there, there just wasn't enough consistency. And so um, we're partnering very closely with, with Michael and the Plymail team and our brand team to uh, develop Microsoft branded assets that we can put into, the, into Plymail so that it creates a really quick and easy way for teams to create on-brand communications. Sort of sending and tracking email is great, but if you can't even put it together, if it's hard to put together, sort of what's the point? And so um, there's a really great functionality in, in Polite Mail that Michael's going to get to in a little bit that, uh, that really talks about how you can do that. Yeah, and one of the notes on that, too, was the, the mobile first. So that was a big initiative at Microsoft. And one of the you know, kind of inherent problems in regular Outlook email is it just doesn't operate great on uh, mobile, particularly if you use images. So the typical thing that happens is you, you send a, a large image and you get it on your mobile device and it shrinks the whole page so your nice 11 point font is now five point and no one can read it. Um, so the page looks right but it's just unreadable. So uh, the Playmail templates are responsive and work in Outlook so that the articles will stack uh, appropriately and the font sizes don't get too small. And the reason I think this is important for everyone is this is 
uh, data of mobile open. So you can see in, in 2013, uh, not particularly high, but that rate has just been growing aggressively since then. And so more and more people, you can see desktop opens coming down, mobile opens going up, representing close to 20%. So that has a couple of implications, right? Um, there's this thing called mobility management software now. So if people are accessing their email on their mobile device, but your internet isn't accessible, then all those links are basically going to be dead links. But there's lots of software. Microsoft has some. Uh, VMware has, has some. But basically, it'll authenticate your device so that people can reach uh, the internet and be um, authorized to access to it. So that's important, uh, as well as having the emails respond appropriately. And, and so that's just, that trend is just going to continue. Uh, to grow. And then the other thing with mobile is you probably notice here there's a bunch. Uh, there's a big push on these mobile apps. And uh, I think the killer mobile app is actually email. Uh, I know that, I, you know, being here at the conference, I'm going to be on my, that's how I'm going to get all my messages. Um, any of you that use a phone, you probably do it yourself. Uh, there's large, you know, a lot of our customers are manufacturers. So they'll have maybe 40,000 employees, but only eight of those will be desk workers, and the rest will be on the floor. And there's always the, the question, like, how do we reach those people? How do we get those people engaged? How can we keep them informed? And everyone's looking at mobile apps and, and all these other solutions. And uh, my point is, why are we forgetting about email? And, and Microsoft actually has a, a solution, this F1 account, which is a $4 a month office account, which gives them more than just email. Um, all sorts of tools, and it's you know it's the most intuitive, obvious way to get mobile. But I think people are just not necessarily aware of it, or you know they're they're searching in different directions. So just my thing is like that's, that's probably a very simple uh, solution that people should look at. So if your IT is not aware of it, you can make them aware of it. Um, and so these are just some examples of uh, what we're doing with the templates and how they work both on the the desktop and mobile. So this is those. Uh, CEO emails, and uh, one of the things we'll talk about a little later, too, is uh, how Microsoft's using video uh, to get these uh, executive communications across. So that's uh, one category. and You can kind of see the brand standards reflected through here. Um, so this is an example of their uh, one of their uh, newsletters uh, and then their um, HR uh, communications. Uh, and one thing you'll notice, too, is a lot of use of visuals. Uh, and I have some data on that. Um, but Microsoft is optimizing for readability or readership, um, which is different than optimizing for open rates. And I'll show you some, some data on that. But use of visuals is very important when it comes to having people actually read uh, the email. And so this is how uh, Playmail works. We'll add this template builder into Outlook. Uh, we'll give you a tool that lets you pick page components. Um, and those components, again, can be pre-branded and, and laid out uh, the way you want. And people just assemble the page. Uh, and then you can modify it right in the Outlook editor. So you can change pictures, change text. It just becomes an Outlook message at that point. But it's, it's built out of these components that are the responsive bits. Um, all right. Yeah. So um, hand it over. You know, as I mentioned, we, we've sent a lot of email. And um, we had a lot of questions about what drove uh, engagement. Um, and so the uh, next couple of slides will walk through um, some of the questions we had and, and some of the findings that we, we found. So our first question was, how quickly do people interact with a message? So um, do we need to wait two weeks before we look at results? Can we look at results after a couple hours? And so um, we ended up uh, going back and looking at a ton of our old data um, and put together this chart and found that um, after two hours, more than 80% of the engagements happen. And so that told us that uh, we could start to do some micro uh, or rapid sort of A-B testing. Um, we could go and we could look at, um, we could send out uh, an email to a small test group of, of employees, test a subject line, for example, see which one performed better, and then take that after two hours, pick the best one, and then apply it to the rest of the, the employee audience. And so um, if you go to the next slide. So, what we did is we took uh, our we took our uh, sort of intranet newsletter um, and um, th that had been an ongoing uh, effort. Uh, we used that subject line and then took um, content from the newsletter and applied uh, 
three sort of custom headlines. So if there was a story about Satya on AI, that was one of the headlines and so forth and so on. And so we compared those against the standard, you know, kind of boring, typical newsletter subject line of the name of the newsletter plus the date. Um, we sent it out. We uh, waited two hours. We then looked at the results. We then applied it to the sort of next 100,000 employees and, uh, and, and used that best performing subject line for the 100,000 employees. And, um, you'll see that it drove a 7.6% increase in engagement. And so for our audience, that's an extra 9,000 employees who engage with that email because we did those tests. Um, so the sort of actionable takeaway is that unique subject lines uh, increase engagement. So if you have a sort of a standard newsletter, I'd encourage you to think about um, how each, each time you send it out, you can use a unique subject line that sort of pulls from the content in the newsletter. Um, and I think you'll see an increase in, uh, in uh, engagement. The one thing we really haven't been able to crack the code on is sort of um, here's the formula of what makes a great subject line. Um, we see different things that, that make a good subject line, like uh, if we mention another tech company, We'll see, you know, typically it'll, it'll do better. Um, if we mention a Microsoft product, it'll do better. Um, if we mention uh, sort of a benefit like free or discounts or there's a new pub on campus, that'll do well. Um, <laughs> surprise, surprise. Um, and we were sort of surprised that, uh, you know, if we mentioned Satya Nadella, who's our CEO, um, it really can have, uh, you know, it really doesn't have any impact. It can either be low performing or high performing or sort of all the way in between. So. If you use the word compensation in the subject line, that <laughs> tends to work. <laughs> exactly. All right. And then uh, some other data on uh, open rates. And again, opens are really just, it's about reach, right? So an open is telling you how many people are actually getting and looking at the message, but that's really as, as far as it's taking it. Uh, we also have this metric uh, called uh, ignore rate, and if you've done any web analytics, you're familiar with the term bounce. In email, a bounce means something different, like undeliverable. Um, so we use ignore rate, but it's the same concept, right? So if you get an email and you look at it for less than three seconds, we're calling that an ignore, right? So we've all done it. You get it. You look at it quick. It's open, technically open. It's in the preview pane. But next, you move on. Um, so that's an ignore. So you've got to kind of balance. Uh, you know, open rate tells you they got it. But if you have a high ignore rate, then you know, they're not getting the message. Um, and then uh, we, we break that down in various ways. You know, so is there a difference between whether you send from a shared mailbox or another person or yourself? Uh, you know, slight differences there. Uh, the main thing I wanted to key on here is the subject line stuff to follow uh, Eric's research. Um, and so what we see overall, and, and then we're going to break this down by industry, you'll see it changes. Um, but when you use really short subject lines, so less than five words, you have, you know, high uh, engagement or high open rates, people pay attention. Um, for some reason, it fall five to six words. Once you get back up to nine to 11 words, so a really descriptive subject line, now you're increasing engagement again. So either a really short subject line or you know, a 9 to 11 word descriptive subject line is what works you know, in general across our, our customer base. Um, if we switch that, now I've got technology selected um, down there. Uh, and you can see that uh, here, same concept, basically, really short subject lines. Or you know, medium length descriptive subject lines tend to be uh, what works from an engagement perspective. Uh, if we switch that to financials, completely different. So for some reason, only short subject lines work for that audience. And if there's anything of length, it's, it's not quite as high. One thing you'll notice is in financials, the open rates across the board tend to be really good. And I don't know if that's a function. I mean, I got to imagine technology companies and financial companies have the, roughly the same number of desk workers. But for some reason, in our financial service accounts, really high open rates. So maybe they do their lists a lot better. I'm not sure. Um, and then in healthcare, as you would expect, uh, lower open rates. You know, Lots of nurses, lots of people moving around that aren't tied to a desk. Uh, but here, uh, you know, again, completely different analysis on the subject lines. Short subject lines aren't working nearly as well as long descriptive subject lines. So only the ones that work in healthcare tend to be those uh, 9 to 11, or the ones that work best. All right. So the, the next thing that we were really curious about was, is there a particular day of the week that's going to 
perform better. Um, you know, there's sort of the old PR adage of don't send anything on a Monday or a Friday. And um, so we were wondering, you know, is, is interactions going to go up if we send it midweek? Um, and so what we did is we um, took our, our internet newsletter again, um, and we sent out a mail in the morning and a mail in the afternoon to a, to a test group. And we did that every day for, um, for three weeks. Um, and so we had 30 emails uh, total uh, to go and look at the results. And um, you know, again, sort of to our surprise and maybe disappointment, because we really were hoping we could find that, that sort of magic day to, to send something on, um, they all perform relatively the same, sort of within the, the margin of error. And so um, you know, our sort of takeaway here is that you know, really send, send the mail on the day that works best for your team. Um, there really is no, uh, no great day, or at least at Microsoft, there is no, no perfect day to send an email, um, which is incredibly freeing, because uh, I think I, I, every group would have been sending it Tuesday morning if, uh, <laughs> if, uh, if that was the, the day that, that we found the results worked better. Yep. And in, in our data, we see a slight preference for the morning. Um, and so these are broken up into day parts. Um, so slight preference for the morning versus evening in terms of open rates. Um, but generally, there is no you know, specific uh, time of day. Um, there is some data that we can pull out of the read timing, um, which is worth uh, highlighting uh, here. And, uh, and again, the, the read time I, I kind of explained. So you, you notice on the, by the sender type, um, you know, sending from a shared mailbox versus sending as another person, usually on behalf of an executive versus sending of yourself. Those were pretty even in terms of opens, but there's actually a 10% variance in terms of readership. Uh, so you know, sending as yourself tends to be lower readership than sending as uh, a shared mailbox for whatever, uh, whatever particular reason. Um, what I wanted to get to here on this slide is just that top uh, corner. What we're measuring there is Percent read, so the so the you know if you sent two minutes of email, what percent? How much time did people spend on that versus the length uh, of the email that was sent? And you see a pretty distinct trend there, right? So the longer the email, uh, the less people are going to read. And I think that's just you know if there's any question about uh, you know good use of email, it's you know short content. I think a lot of us are forced into doing long content newsletters or long content, you know, long-winded executive communications. And in general, uh, you know, once you get beyond four minutes of content, your your readership, you know, the amount people are going to read is going to drop below twenty percent. So why, you know, why even bother, you know? Um, and then um, back to the. Uh, optimizing for readership in terms of images. I'm going to break this down by industry too because there are some differences. But that trend uh, basically on the far side is you know if you send an all text email, uh, and then on the other side is if you send it with mostly images. And the general trend is you know if you're using images in your email, people are going to read more of it. And so visuals. Uh, if I break that down to just technology. Uh, you can see how this is working here. So, um, you know, lower readership with no images. If you have just one image, you bump that right up. And if you again skew it more heavily to images versus text, now you're on the the higher end of of readership. And I have we'll a question. to links, yeah. Does a color banner with text on it count as an image? Uh, does it, it can, yeah. Picture? Yeah, that if it, if it's a JPEG or from our analysis, if that's a JPEG or a GIF or what have you, so so header images do technically count as uh, an image. I'm somewhat anti-header myself because I think you can use the from address a lot of cases, uh, particularly for newsletters, right? If you can get your IT team to give you a from address that's the name of the newsletter versus doing a big banner, now you've saved all that real estate. You can immediately move your first article. Up to the top, and uh, I think that Eric's next section, you'll see why that's important. Um, and and then you're using the identification as the from address. Um, so it's you know dependent on having a cooperative IT team mm -hmm. that will give you the email address. So, uh, so um, has Microsoft ever considered um, integrating some of these tools into Outlook, um, at least the open rates, because that's something that I know has always been an issue um, for me, that you send something out and you have no idea who opened it. Yeah, no, I think, um, great, great question. Um, 
I can't speak for the sort of the Outlook product team, um, <laughs> but you know we're excited to partner with Michael to sort of bring that functionality into into Outlook for for our teams at the current time. Question, question over there. Oh, sure, we can go through that. <laughs> Uh, you were talking about shorter content as um, increases how many people read it. When you're talking about a newsletter, what about the sort of typical kind of headline and then like a little bit of a descriptor plus a read more? Mm -hmm. Does that seem to help? Yeah. Or because yeah. we, we kind of had the opposite reaction at our really? organization that said, "Oh no, we want to. You know, we want to. We don't like clicking more than once in a in a newsletter." So I just didn't know if you had right. Any stats or any information? It depends. That. I guess it, part of it is going to be dependent on how many stories you're putting in there. Because I think that's also, you know, if there's a lot of stories, that becomes a lot more difficult. Um, I think the other thing there, too, is um, how difficult is it? You know, where's the read more going and how difficult is it for the user experience, right? So if I'm on my phone, I now need to authenticate, et cetera, et cetera, you know, then it, I'd rather have all the content in the newsletter. So, um, you know, I think it, it depends on, you know, on, on sort of that full experience. Thank you. So, um, a, about a uh, earlier this year in January, we we started supporting um, the our, our monthly Q and A with with Satya, um, and um, with a sort of recap mail um, and doing um, sort of in the the, the vein of shorter. Um, we started taking uh, the full hour long presentation as you can see on top, and started breaking it into these. Um, shorter snackable videos, and the snackable videos can be anywhere from you know two minutes to um, this is a really long answer on immigration uh, that, that was nine minutes. But um, we really wanted to, to give uh, employees the opportunity to see the sort of the most important content um, from the Q and As and deliver it in, a, in an email. Um, but we started to wonder um, after a couple of months of how does the positioning of the videos impact uh, engagement. Um, and so we decided we'd, we'd do a test. So we broke uh, a group into, into, into eight different groups. Um, and uh, we took the eight snackable videos and we rotated them through. So I think there's a little animation. Um, and basically, each group, sort of the, the stories rotated um, through a different position. Um, so the click rates were uh, for positions were averaged across the eight templates. Uh, this removes the um, the impact that a popular story may uh, have uh, on the results. Um, and the key takeaway here is that really position does does matter. Um, the number one position, um, as you can see on the chart on the left, really uh, performs much better than any of the other videos. And then after four videos, we really see a really steep decline in or, or almost sort of. No, no viewership, and so this then informed us that the snackables took a little bit of time to create and work and get approved and everything, and so we were able to go back to the CEO team and say, really, we should create sort of four videos because that's the right sort of sweet spot of how many videos are going to get uh, are going to get watched. The other piece uh, on the next slide um, is how effective email can be at driving traffic back to your internet site. So uh, all the videos are hosted there. Uh, you can see sort of. Uh, in blue, where Infopedia, that's where we host our, uh, our, our videos. Um, the polite mail clicks show uh, you know, a really close trend line there. So our email that we sent out driving the majority of clicks to, uh, to the videos. And then uh, our internet site uh, on April 16th ran another promotion for a video, uh, and it got a nice little bump. So you know, email's a great traffic driver back to your internet site um, uh, to, to, drive, uh, to drive viewership. All right, cool. And I think it's important to note, too, that uh, you know, some of Microsoft's innovation with the, the Sacha videos. Uh, a lot of you will probably do, you know, town halls or executive QAs, presentations. And one thing they're doing to drive that employee engagement is, is same day production of those emails. So the executive does the, the video, they carve up, uh, you know, we've got the, the templates all, all ready to go. They carve up the video into those snackable bites and they send it out uh, the same day so they can get a really wide. Uh, engagement level through the company for what was a, you know, a fairly smaller audience um, for those really important communications. A um, couple other things on, on links. Um, so again, average uh, link rate, 11%. Uh, doesn't seem particularly great. You know, it varies uh, across the board. Um, one thing you'll see here um, in this, 
the chart on the left middle there, the 20% uh, rate. So if you really want to get someone to click something, um, that's telling you if you have an email with one link on it, you're going to double your click-through rate. Right? So if you really want someone to do something, that applies for, for benefits, communications, or you know, sign up for something or participate in something, uh, one link. Don't, you know, don't muddy the water, basically. You're going to get people to take action if you give them one thing to do versus giving them multiple options. Uh, and then it gets pretty static after that. So whether you're sending two or 15 links in the email, relatively, you know, your overall click rate is going to stay uh, roughly the same. Uh, there is a, a strong trend, uh, and this is at the bottom, click rates uh, by time of day. And this is time of day sent. So when the email is sent early in the morning, uh, much higher click rate than if it's sent later in the afternoon. And, and uh, my theory, we need to map this. Uh, I want to map this back to the data when, when they actually clicked, because uh, I think that would be important to know. But uh, my theory on this is like when people have the mail in their inbox for the, for the day, uh, they're more apt to take action on it. Yep, yeah, this is a global view, so not specific to any particular industry, but we can break the data down that way. Any data on if you got like a clickable image or like a button versus the regular hyperlink text? Yeah, so we, we are trying to, we have that data somewhat, but uh, we have to massage it a little too. So what we're trying to do is isolate emails that have both a text link and an image link of the same thing and see which one people are more apt to click on. Uh, but I guess from you know from the guys doing the BI work, it's not you know it's not an easy process to isolate it down to that. So they're still working on that one. But that, that is a question we asked. Um, so again, this is just again highlighting that same thing I mentioned before: uh, one link, higher click rates. Um, and then we do break it down. Uh, so here for technology, um, again, you know, kind of the opposite trend, right? So. If you're sending in the afternoon, slightly higher click rate than sending in the morning uh, for whatever reason. Uh, in healthcare, uh, middle of the afternoon sends tend to work better, again, for whatever reason is to that. You know, and like anything, you know, your results may vary. Um, <laughs> you know, your mileage may vary depending on your particular uh, audience. Um, but what you can do, a lot of times when we first start with customers, they'll ask, well, here's our open rate. Is it any good? Like, what's a good open rate? So you can use this benchmark data uh, to map against your own data. You know, and we break it down by industry and by uh, distribution list size. So you can kind of look, you know, based on my industry or based on my audience size, how am I doing compared to uh, the group? And so in general, if I take all that benchmark data and consolidate it down to one recommendation, it's uh, send less content uh, more often use images, you know, and send it on a regular schedule in the morning. And we haven't broken down the scheduling thing. Again, it's one of those uh, we're studying cadence uh, and trying to figure out. Because um, there's this whole issue of email overload, and we're, we're starting to see that some of the email overload issue is definitely content length. So people can get that. If they get, you know, a lot of emails with a lot of content, that starts to give them that, you know, email overload feeling like I'm not going to be able to get through this stuff. Uh, and also high volume of messages from the same mailbox on a single day. Uh, we haven't completed the analysis, but you start to see lower open and read rates the more messages people get from the same mailbox on a specific day, which, again, seems quite intuitive, but often violated. Um, <laughs> and so that, that particularly for news uh, letters, um, you know, that regular schedule, so when people can anticipate a message coming at a specific time, they kind of carve out that time in their in their day for that message versus randomly. And I think if we go back to uh, Eric's analysis early, is like when people respond to the email, most of it happens within that two hours. So a lot of the email you're sending, you're actually you are interrupting people, right? You have to be aware of that. Like when you send out an email, you're 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 potentially changing people's workflow or process. So the more that you can fit into their, their day, the more responsive they're going to be. All right. And with that, we can open yeah, it up we'll to Yeah, we'll open it up for questions. questions. We'll have about five minutes or so. Any questions? Question back there. Where? Oh, there. sure. Oh, sorry. Back. Me you, again. You get the um, award for that. <laughs> the most and best questions. <laughs> um, how long did it take for you guys to initially get set up with Blackmail to you know, kind of get it up and running, so to speak? I know, uh, obviously, you're making constant tweaks, but... 
Yeah, you know, I think um, it's a it's a relatively um, easy process, but there are a lot of folks involved. Um, you know, at least for for us with um, IT and security and Azure and and whatnot. So um, it probably took three, three months. months, maybe, to to get it set up and, and running, and then. Um, you know, I think we learned a lot as we, we got we got going in terms of sort of the support model we needed, um, just given sort of the complexity of um, you know the way the, the mails are coming in. We we have a hosted solution, so mails are coming in externally and in, in, in into Microsoft, and so that creates some complexity of security and, and whatnot. And so um, getting all those things lined up and working, um, you know, has been a, a process to, to fine tune. But I think we're we've got a great groove. Yeah, unfortunately, we do. It does involve IT. You know, so it it does create that that roadblock, and there's always nowadays with all the security breaches, there's always looking at like how's the data secured. We do have the on-prem and the hosted model, so we can host it in Azure, you know, specifically for your company. So we don't do like a shared host; we do dedicated per customer, so that helps with security. And then we can also do on-prem. So most of those, most of our financial service accounts actually will will put it. On-prem, it's a bigger IT project, um, but that way all the data stays inside your company and uh, the security risk is all in their hands. Yeah, um, my question is, uh, are all these uh, conclusions uh, based uh, have language preferences or mainly in the environment of English-speaking countries? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know uh, if I go back. I don't know if this will loop all the way around. Um, there, We have... You know, the, uh, all those email receipts are coming from all over the world, if you remember that map way at the beginning. Um, majority are definitely uh, U.S., Canada, um, but it's not language-specific uh, necessarily. Like Chinese? Yeah, so, I, you know, I don't, we don't really break it out that okay. way, so. Okay, one more. And uh, do you think punctuation counts um, or matters uh, relating to the clicking rates in the headline? In a, like punctuation, like yeah, like uh, brackets or to as a highlight yeah. that can help people to click it. Yeah. So in our um, in our aggregated data, we we don't we're you so that's why on the subject line analysis we're only doing word count. Um, when we apply this, our intent is to um, apply this uh, BI interface to specific customer accounts. And in that case, we would uh, the tool would have access to the specific words and language used in the email itself versus just saying how many words are in it. Uh, and then you can do neat things like word cloud. Like I mentioned compensation, a couple of our beta accounts, that was in both cases the word cloud of what makes, you know, so we took, uh, the analysis was let's take the highest performing uh, open rates and see what words show up in the subject line. And you can do that with a word cloud. You know, the words get bigger based on their popularity. Uh, the biggest word in both of those cases was compensation. So when compensation's in the subject line, people pay, atten yeah. people pay attention. But So there's things like that that we can use when we apply the Power BI stuff to a specific account that we can't do when we're genericizing it. Uh, uh, related to the Power BI, so uh, there are a lot of data pulling out from, from the email uh, you, uh, you just shared. So do you need to do some customization on the Power BI side to get those data? Um, you as you, the customer? Yeah, the customer. Yeah, no. So, well, I'll say no. If, if you're happy with what we provide, then no. Um, but most what, what's happened, again, we're only kind of in the beta uh, of this. Um, and, you know, so we're using it for our benchmark, like trying to extract insights from all clients, but now we're trying to apply it to specific clients. Um, so far in the betas that we've done, immediately they start asking mm -hmm. other questions that then requires different analysis, you know, different visualizations be created to answer those questions. Um, so ultimately I would say, uh, you know, no in general, but probably yes um, in specifics, because there, there may be a question that you want to ask. Um, there is actually a neat tool in, in Power BI. I don't know if you've played around with it, but they have a question interface. It's kind of hidden, but once you've loaded the data, you can actually type an, a, a natural language question, and it will give you uh, what so far in our test has been a, a fairly reasonable answer. It's, it's a fairly buried feature. Uh, and again, Power BI is one of those tools that 
you know, not probably not a lot of communicators will use because it's it's a math tool basically. Yeah. But uh, if you can get it to the interface level, then it's really uh, useful. And we're trying to figure out a way to, to elevate that question interface because it, it does work surprisingly well. Um, so that may be a way where you know you as a communicator can just ask the question, and if those data elements are there, it actually is able to surface it. Great. We'll take one last question here. Um, so if you want to send an email to all employees, but then you want to look at maybe different segments of employees within that, um, can, can you do that? Like, does it pull different attributes of employees, say job title? Yeah. So to, by, you know, by default, without any extra setup, uh, we'll segment by distribution group. So in a lot of companies, that employees list will be broken out departmentally or regionally. Uh, sometimes not. Sometimes it's a big flat list. Um, but when it's broken out into sublists, um, then we can pull out those segments. Uh, we have had issues, particularly in Microsoft's case, where some of those lists are like heavily nested, right? So it's lists within lists within lists. Once it gets over about 100 of those, you know, we've had some bugs um, breaking those out, uh, and performance kind of suffers in those scenarios. But you know, a reasonably nested list, we can pull them out. Uh, if we do the uh, list management tool where we're mapping to HR data, uh, then we can do any segment you want. So, for instance, Con Edison in New York is they're breaking it down to male, female, they're breaking it out to union, non union, they've got different departments and divisions. So, they're doing some really you know, unique to their scenario uh, segmentation. But for any email they send, they can break it down by any of those subgroups. And we're just using uh, the data that we're extracting from HR to build those segments. We typically take our all employee list and we'll break it out by region at the very least and look at it at engagement by region. So there's lots of different ways you can do with the list management tool. Thank you. And I know, Michael, you'll be out at your exhibitor table with Jill and Nicole. And uh, Eric, will you be around at all today during the sure. conference? So if you do have additional questions, I encourage you to see them there and go get information from Michael. But thank you both so much. All right. Thank you. Thank you.